Every year, 250 to 500,000 individuals are diagnosed with spinal cord injury. That's equivalent to five Wembley stadiums at full capacity. The idea of a spinal cord injury may seem a world away from our daily routine, but anything from an innocent fall to a sudden road accident could change one's life forever. A spinal cord injury is defined as damage to the spinal cord that causes temporary or permanent changes in its function. The compression or severing of the spinal cord leads to axonal death in both directions and damages the nerves at the end of the spinal canal. Spinal cord injuries at the cervical level account for 60% of injuries, and these can progress into paraplegia, quadriplegia, or tetraplegia. Imagine waking up to being told that never again will you be able to experience the joys of running with your children, walking your dog in the morning, or simply feeling the warm touch of a loved one. All of a sudden, you're back to basics, trying to redefine everything you once took for granted. Not only are you adapting into a new mental state, you're also told that no cure exists for your condition. Instead, the main therapeutic focus has been to mask all your discomforts, such as inflammation and chronic pain. We are Renovate, King's College London's iGEM team, and we have identified a group of vulnerable patients who need innovative medical support. Our aim is to provide a novel, inexpensive, and revolutionary treatment for spinal cord injury using a biocompatible scaffolding coated with a muscle foot protein-based adhesive. The focus of our research is to try and support patients with chronic cervical spinal cord injuries, which appear to be the most limited patient subset in receiving treatments. This is because spinal cord injuries induce axonal death, and unfortunately, there is limited possibility for them to regenerate due to the increase in growth and matrix inhibitory molecules. The resultant inhibitory environment, coupled with the lower intrinsic ability of the central nervous system, neurons to regenerate, greatly limits the possibility of neuronal sprouting. This can be resolved by providing a bridge that facilitates axonal guidance through topology and topography. Additionally, glial scar, scar formation around the lesion creates both physical and chemical barriers to regeneration, and these are further exasperated by the inflammatory cell invasion. Therefore, the resection of the glial scar provides a more permissive environment. Overall, regrowth is hindered by the hostile environment, the formation of the glial scar, and the reduced intrinsic ability of central nervous system neurons to grow. We initially explored the implementation of a hydrogel and the use of proteases. Certain proteases are able to promote repair through regeneration of lesioned axons, sprouting connectivity of remaining pathways and neuroprotection. Proteases break down proteins and peptides and can be clinically useful for the treatment of the glial scar. Despite the promise of proteases, specifically conjoinase ABC, in their treatment for smaller and more manageable lesions, we concluded more structural support was required for axonal regrowth of the larger lesions at the cervical level. After performing extensive literature research and consulting experts in the field, we determined a personalized scaffold was the optimum approach for our project design. When designing a scaffold, there is a wide range of criteria to follow to ensure that the scaffold is successful. After conducting literature reviews and then interviewing experts as part of our human practices, we generated a scaffold specification sheet. Further from this, we ensured that each engineering decision made throughout our project was executed with these requirements in mind. Following the requirements outlined on the previous slide, we decided to explore two potential routes for scaffold material candidates, natural and synthetic polymers. Synthetic polymers are great for mechanical strength, having higher machine ability and also having more controllable degradation rates than their natural counterparts. Conversely, natural materials are better for biological performance in cell proliferation and differentiation. Owing to these strengths, we initially proposed to use polycaprolactone, a synthetic material blended with chitazan, a natural material. However, following consultations with experts Dr. Matisse Real and Dr. Jacob Koffler, we learned that chitazan has a higher risk of being immunogenic. Therefore, we chose to use solely PCL as our material, an FDA-approved synthetic polymer. The main downside of this material is its unfavorable adhesion, a common disadvantage of synthetic polymers. However, this is where synthetic biology comes in, which one of my colleagues will discuss later on. Macroarchitecture is the overall shape of our scaffold, or what it looks like at a quick glance without considering the surface structure, and is crucial to the success of a therapeutic scaffold. This slide covers a few of the reasons why macroarchitecture alone is extremely important. Even without added biofactors, regeneration may be successfully achieved by just considering shape alone. Studies have shown that a larger surface area may support more growth and subsequently improve the guidance of axons, ensuring that they traverse the whole of the defect length. 
Literature reviews have also highlighted that shape plays an important role in reducing scarring. Conversely, some shapes, such as cylinders, cause a lengthening of the defect, which is something that we want to avoid. The mechanical properties of the scaffold are of utmost importance. For example, the Young's modulus, or elasticity of the scaffold, should be as close to the spine as possible, and the scaffold should be able to withstand the forces in the environment. We understood we needed to ensure our scaffold design took these into account, but there was a lack of prior studies regarding this design aspect. Following a paper by Dr. Doris Wong, we implemented the design of five potential macro structure candidates within Autodesk Inventor to allow for mechanical testing simulation. We carried out finite element analysis using the Inventor Nastran environment. Here are the von Mises stress results. The blue areas indicate minimum stress and the red maximum. Here are the overall results of our simulations. We considered properties such as the von Mises stress and strain and the displacement of each part of the scaffold when a simple gravitational load is applied. The open path width core was the best structure mechanically, which supported literature suggesting that this design is also optimal for exonal regrowth. Therefore, we chose this to be our final scaffold design. The open areas are for the descent of corticospinal tracts and the central cylinder adds an extra surface for the guidance of nerve fibres. After consultation with Dr Novak Elliot, we decided that it was necessary to expand on our mechanical simulation model and, in the end, our model demonstrated that the chosen final design would be able to withstand the pressure from a cough, validating that the scaffold should be mechanically sound even in extreme cases. 3D bioprinting the scaffold allows us to tailor each implant to a specific patient. We propose that each patient would have a CT or MRI scan of their lesion, and from here the image can be segmented, such that the dimensions of the cyst can be extracted. Following this, the open path with core design may be adjusted to this specific size. We'd like to thank Antonio Pontiki for showing us how to use ITK Snap, a segmentation software, and Dr. Bryn Martin, who provided us with anonymized patient scans so that we could demonstrate our scaffold design methodology. Microarchitecture also plays a crucial role in scaffold fabrication. This specifically is the shape of the surface of the scaffold. Two of the prominent design features include pores, which are essentially interconnected holes on the scaffold, and grooves, which are like small ridges on the surface. Pores have been used more extensively in literature within scaffold engineering and have been proved to be successful. On the other hand, the incorporation of grooves would add another step within the production process, making it less repeatable, less time effective and potentially more expensive. After consulting with an expert, Dr. Koffler, we decided not to overcomplicate the design. Therefore, we focused solely on the porosity of the scaffold. Pores have been shown to be beneficial for promoting regrowth, but for also ensuring that the scaffold has a closer match to the mechanical properties of the spinal cord. We discovered that our initial CAD software, Autodesk Inventor, didn't have the capability to implement such architecture. Therefore, we created an algorithm we called the porosifier for generating porosity using the grasshopper extension for Rhino with the assistance of Aaron Porterfield. This allowed us to create a final scaffold of 58% porosity and an average size of 200 micrometers. We decided to make the script open source to allow others to add pores more effectively in a range of applications. This grasshopper script is easily adjustable and in fact can be applied to any arbitrary shape. As briefly mentioned earlier, the degradation rate is a crucial factor to optimise in terms of design. We carried out literature reviews and investigated factors within the spinal cord that have a degradative effect on PCL. Following the equations presented in these studies, we created our own MATLAB program to simulate the degradation of a polymer scaffold, as we could not identify a similar software. Our program allows the user to enter molecular weight values to be tested, as well as a known degradation rate or the porosity of their scaffold, as long as the material is PCL for the latter. However, the code can easily be modified to incorporate a porosity relationship from material other to PCL obtained from experimental data. After receiving the inputs, the program develops a graph to depict the degradation prediction. We have used this program to determine an absolute minimum starting molecular weight of 9.9 kilodaltons so that our scaffold will last a year. We have made this program open source and invite others to test the degradation of a scaffold for any chosen material, ensuring that it is a polymer that undergoes bulk erosion. Up until this point, we have optimised the scaffold as much as possible considering solely shape and material. However, our scaffold does not match our specification outline alone, particularly because PCL has poor adhesion properties and so cannot support substantial cell growth effectively. So, how can we fix this? To solve this issue, 
we needed to turn to synthetic biology, and as a result, we added a new component to our project. To overcome the limitations of PCL, we sought inspiration from the natural world and began to identify carbon bioadhesive candidates. In doing so, we came across the paper, Recombinant Muscle Foot Protein PVFP5-beta, a potential tissue bioadhesive. PVFP5-beta, a muscle foot protein derived from perniviridis, has shown to be non-cytotoxic, non-immunogenic, and highly adhesive. This is due to its role as the first protein to be secreted in the muscle foot, displacing water molecules as it adheres to the surface, enabling for aqueous adhesion. These properties give PVFP5-beta great promise in tissue engineering applications. Past iGEM teams, particularly Great Bay SCIE 2019 and Yale 2014, have noticed the great promise of MFPs as both work towards the creation of MFP-based adhesives. We have decided to build upon their work by employing a tyrosinase-based approach to PVFP5-beta polymerization to create a bioadhesive coating for our PCL scaffold, creating a surface that encourages axonal attachment and thus regrowth. To be able to understand how PVFP5-beta adheres surfaces, we needed to provide a structural model. We sought the help of various academics to generate a working structural model, most notably Professor Annalisa Pastor, Dr. Katerina Alfano, and Dr. Ladislav Hovan. We began by producing a homology model through the FIRE two-fold recognition web server with a 99.7% identity confidence and 84% query coverage. We realized we were missing a known disulfide bridge, therefore, to finalize our model, we employed molecular dynamic simulations using Gromax and Yasara. Based on the feedback of Dr. Mark Fall, we decided to look into consensus design for increasing the stability of our protein. Although this was not completed during this phase of our project, we will continue next year with the ultimate aim of developing a synthetic MFP sequence based on sequences cons conservation across muscle species. Another element of our work with muscle foot protein is our contribution to the R-based IGAM software developed by the University of Calgary. Through our collaboration with the 2020 team, in particular Andrew Symes, the software has been refined for PVFP5-beta and we will use this next year to predict which mutations could potentially increase the adhesiveness of our protein once we have obtained experimental data. Our IGAM script is open source and can be found on our GitHub. Additionally, it can be used by other teams if they would like to continue our work with PVFP5-beta. Through both IGAM and consensus design, we hope to semi-rationally design a protein more suited to applications to our project. In order to activate the adhesive residues of muscle foot proteins, we have prepared the gene expression system for the biosynthesis of tyrosinase alongside PVFP5-beta, following the advice of our supervisors, Professor Annalisa Pastor and Dr. Katerina Alfano. The composite parts that comprise the guy expression system are shown here. This is an improvement on the CSJ method utilized by Great Bay SCIE 2019. The tyrosinase catalyzes the conversion of tyrosine residues into DOPA. Because DOPA is involved in both polymerization of our adhesive via cystinal DOPA bonds, as well as the main adhesive residue for aqueous adhesion, this method enables us to fully synthesize our polymer in vivo. Our parts, which compromise this gene expression system, are shown here. You can visit our contributions page of our wiki for a detailed comparison between previous teams. For our proposed implementation and engineering success, we've designed an experimental workflow to create our bioadhesive coating for phase two of our project. We will firstly polymerize and purify our protein following our plan protocols, which we will then follow up by detecting for successful polymerization using a BCASA. At the advice of Dr. Patrone, we will treat our polymer with sodium sorbate to reduce the frequency of spontaneous oxidation of DOPA residues, sustaining its adhesive capabilities by soaking in acetic acid and the DOPA protecting agent, boronate. This environment is synonymous to the environment MFPs first adhere in the formation of the muscle visceral thread, an excellent use of synthetic biology. To further understand our protein and how it will function in our system, we've designed numerous further experiments. These include adhesive strength via surface force apparatus measurements, cell adhesion and proliferation, as well as cell viability and immunogenicity studies. As an element of our proposed implementation on entrepreneurship, we will move from immortal cell lines to neurites and gradually shift towards animal studies. We will take the time to consider the commercialization of our product and then prepare the polymer to coat our scaffold, ready for surgical use. The protocols for these can be found on our wiki. 
Throughout every aspect of our project, we have strived to find the optimal way to solve our focus problem and create a safe and responsible product. The basis of our project design was expanded through the constant integration of our key stakeholders, including neurosurgeons, patients, and researchers, together providing clinical, academic, and industry guidance. As part of our clinical guidance, we attended a weekly organized cafe for people suffering with a spinal cord injury through the Spinal Injuries Association. This experience informed both our moral and scientific knowledge, particularly highlighting the importance of looking into alternative methods. Our holistic design was inspired by the personal accounts of people living with a spinal cord injury. We researched the applications of massage therapies, the benefits of supplementation, and finally, the benefits of sports such as swimming. We elaborate on the importance of using a holistic therapy in conjunction with our scaffolding in our wiki. Furthermore, this experience highlighted the importance of reducing surgical interventions carried out on patients. We aim for our scaffold to be implanted in a single surgery and will remain in the body throughout the regenerative phase of axons. Our scaffold will retain its mechanical integrity and can degrade over three years, eliminating the requirement of further surgical interventions. In response to our stakeholders' guidance, we organized a series of social media awareness campaigns discussing the importance of prevention of spinal cord injury and highlighting the scientific implications of our design. This has a dual benefit of communicating synthetic biology and its potential benefits due to our use of muscle for proteins and SynBio in our design solution. To communicate our SynBio approach, we created several illustrations to highlight the adhesion mechanism of the protein. We believed it was essential to share our findings with our community because we at Renovate value transparency and science communication. We are additionally passionate about communicating the wider fields of synthetic biology, having created videos and content relating to synthetic biology and COVID-19, and the use of synthetic biology to combat climate change. An example of this is our creation and orchestration of a social media campaign and presentations regarding climate change, communicating how SynBio can help solve problems including coral bleaching, unproductive soils required for food growth, and providing new solutions to degrade plastics. As a team, we believed it was essential to improve the inclusivity and accessibility of opportunities in both STEM and synthetic biology. We researched into the importance of intersectionality and the barriers in STEM, which inspired the creation of our free biologics award for students in their penultimate year of high school. This award will be facilitated by volunteers from our new biotechnology and synthetic biology society at King's College London and from the wider iGym community. We aim to provide an opportunity for all students to gain scientific, entrepreneurial and transferable skills whilst exploring how biotechnology and synthetic biology can be employed to solve global and local problems. Entrepreneurship is a uniting passion of our team, and we have incorporated it into our biologics competition to facilitate the expansion of others' knowledge in this field. Our keen interest in entrepreneurship has led us to design a project aligned with the possibility of commercialization. We thoroughly enjoyed exploring this beyond our proposed implementation and the opportunity to work towards achieving excellence in entrepreneurship. Our entrepreneurship work has included exploring the necessary steps we would need to take to turn our project into a startup company. Following our identification of a gap in the market and our research into potential stakeholders, customers, and the current unmet needs. We have created our lean business plan. We also research into the legislation surrounding medical device development in the UK and European market. Through searching relevant patents, we have ensured and justified that we are not at risk of IP infringements. We utilized the Owners Institute six-step plan for CE certification and planned how we could adhere to the relevant regulatory bodies, including the MHRA. Prior to finalizing our clinical investigation plan, we researched into the safety issues of similar therapeutics within the MOD database. It was imperative we ensured our development plan met NICE guidelines. In doing this, we ensured it was suitable to be offered as a treatment on the British NHS. Additionally, we have strategized how to scale our product to serve a larger market. We have um, condensed all we have learned into a general guide for other iGEM teams to utilize when planning the commercialization of their project. Finally, we would like to extend a big thank you to our PIs, supervisors, and sponsors for their ongoing support. Without them, we wouldn't be where we are today, presenting in front of you. Thank you.